Okay, we're going to go ahead and call the Senate Committee on Revenue and Economic Development to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Buck? Here. Uh, Senator Donate? Here. Senator Severs Ganser? Here. Senator Spearman? Here. And Chair Neal? Here. All right, um, just some simple housekeeping items. Please uh, make sure that you mute your cell phones. If you are planning and calling in on testimony, the number is on the agenda for you to call in support, opposition and neutral. I know we have um, individuals here who have a strong opinion about SB 68. My hope is that you're respectful to the presenter. Um, and we will go ahead, we have two bills today, so we are gonna go ahead and call our presenter to the table, Ms. Adler, to present SB 68. And I believe you have a co-presenter down south. If you could come to the table down south. All right, let me know when you're ready to go. I am, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I will start by asking my colleague, Char Frost, Chair of the Clark Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board, to do her introduction of the bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you for allowing us to present this bill today. My name is Char Frost. I am the chair of the Clark Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board. Um, so I just wanted to give some background on where this bill actually started. Um, in 2018, I was a first time home buyer here in Las Vegas. In 2020, as many others were, I was suddenly working at home with a view onto the street right in front of my house. Um, what I found was there were a tremendous amount of obviously unhoused individuals traversing up and down my street to get to Tropicana Avenue. But what was really scary to me was that so many of them were so young. Um, so during that time, <clears throat> I called my friend and fellow board member, Ariana Saunders, and, and asked, what can we do? How can we address this? There has to be something we can do to alleviate some of these um, really tremendously, um, significantly mentally ill substance misuse and so on and so forth. So we kind of came up with a game plan. We went to our board. And after voting to address this issue in a bill, um, Ms. Mrs. Adler came to us on behalf of NAMI and said, hey, we have, we have this idea. Can, can we infuse that into your bill? And that's where we started, and here's where we're at. So I will turn it over to Mrs. Adler. Thank you very much, Char, and again, good afternoon, members of the committee. It's an honor to be here with you today. I am Sarah Adler, a longtime NAMI Nevada member, a founder of NAMI Western Nevada, and I have been doing policy work as a volunteer for NAMI for several years. So uh, we are very pleased to present to you Senate Bill 68, and on we go. So. I have a habit when communicating of trying to put the bottom line at the top. So that's what I've done here in the first two slides. If Senate Bill 68 becomes law, the outcome will be that we add an affordable housing role to the real property transfer tax. And we will direct additional amount of real property transfer tax to what is called the critical needs fund. So as you're likely aware, currently, 10 cents of every 500 sales value th is directed through the RPTT to the account for affordable housing. This amount was established in 1989, and it has not been increased since then. It is used, very importantly, as the state match to federal <coughs> home dollars, which is the way that we deeply subsidize some of the units, for example, in our low-income housing tax credit properties. It also is used as a manufactured home lot rental subsidy for extremely low-income people living in manufactured homes. 
So SB 68 in section 14 increases the RPTT by 20 cents per $500 of sales value with that increased amount going into the critical needs fund. What would the effect of that be? It would be an additional $160 on a $400,000 home purchase transaction. So it is a, a very small amount of money, significant but small amount of money on a large lifetime transaction. The critical needs funds go into two different buckets. And as Char just discussed, supportive housing, uh, housing to successfully uh, give safe housing to homeless individuals, to people recovering from addiction, that's a big need. But this is a statewide bill. And rural Nevada, we really have not worked there most of my career. We really have not developed a supportive housing uh, capacity, if you will. But there is an enormous need for housing stability. So the critical needs fund creates two buckets. 25% must go into the housing stability bucket. 25% must go into the supportive housing and services bucket. And our partners, the regional behavioral health policy boards, after consultation with the county and others in their area, they decide that 50% in the middle, hey, we're Clark County, we're ready to go big in supportive housing, let's put most of our money there. Hey, I'm Northeast Nevada, let's put most of our money in housing stability, we can use that right away. So we create those two buckets. And what will the result be? The result will be a Nevada-generated critical needs fund that without the eligibility criteria that comes with different kinds of federal dollars, this can be like the mortar surrounding and leveraging bricks of federal, of local government, of philanthropic funding preventing at-risk Nevadans from falling through the cracks created by federal and other eligibility requirements. We can leverage and match those dollars. So Nevada-based critical needs funds will catalyze statewide effective and sustainable supportive housing, we need to get there in rural Nevada, and targeted housing stability. Now, let's stop for a moment and look at, is this really needed? Here is just the simplest uh, data to demonstrate that need. First, there's harm. 366 Nevadans, homeless Nevadans died last year, as reported by Clark and Washoe County. Some, uh, you're familiar with the annual point in time count. It happened, I think, February 24th this year. I participated in it here in Carson City. Across our state, 7,618 people were identified that one day as homeless. And everyone who participates, the continuums of care, do a fantastic job, but, but realize this is an undercount. So there's uh, the harm that is being done by lack of uh, supportive housing. The need for that housing stability, additional housing affordability and eviction prevention dollars, we have today 26,100 people on our public housing authority waiting lists. And you should know that, for example, Nevada Rural Housing Authority, their waiting list was open one week and got 5,000 people onto the waiting list in one week. Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority has, their waiting, has had their waiting list open six days, and after six days, 17,000 people were on the waiting list. So there is an enormous need for more housing affordability. Even more so beyond our PHA waiting lists, this is data from the National Low Income Housing uh, Corporation, their GAP report. The, this tells us that we have a need for 101,000 additional affordable units for people at 50% of area median income, 80,000 for people at 30%. But I direct you to the lower right corner here. Severe rent burden means that you are paying more than 50% of your household income for your rent. At our lowest income, Nevadans at 30% of AMI and below, 81 out of 100 of our lowest income Nevadans are paying more than 50% of their household income for their housing. 
thank goodness we have amazing food banks and food pantries in our state that help supplement the need for basic resources. So what's the impact of this harm and of this need? So a 2016 study uh, re reported that 20% uh, of the individuals who were homeless drove 60% of service costs in healthcare corrections and homeless services. That's just one example of the impact of these dollars. There's impact in the governor's budget as well. As you are aware, the governor has decided we need to put state dollars to, or he's recommending, uh, to converting a portion of the Las Vegas City Jail into a forensic hospital, more forensic service work at Ross and Neal, and then building a ground up forensic hospital. At the same time, he is able to provide us, uh, all of us Nevadans, with some assistance with a gas tax holiday, uh, a reduction in the MBT, that actually, ooh, typo, that actually is statutory, and then he raises the exemption uh, from the commerce tax. So back to um, our big picture here, just a little more detail on how it would work with these two buckets of funding. So let's go to housing stability first. On the right-hand side, we have, and it's so efficient in Nevada, it's fantastic, we have just three regional housing authorities. The housing authority that serves the behavioral health region uh, will receive at least 25% of the critical needs dollars. What they can do with it is rental assistance, is eviction prevention assistance. And then because we're here to serve rural Nevada, home repair is very important. There is a federal weatherization program, but it can't apply its dollars to a home that lacks adequate accessibility and adequate stability. So in uh, home repair is also an eligible use of housing stability dollars. To receive housing stability dollars, you need to be at 50% AMI or below. But the bill establishes priority for extremely low-income Nevadans, uh, Nevadans at 30% and below. Over here on the left-hand side is our supportive housing and services buckets. And this, I think, is very exciting. And for example, I had conversations with Catholic Charities North and South yesterday, who are already engaged in forms of supportive housing. But on an annual basis, so each of our five behavioral health regions will have reported to them the amount of money in their region. Now, I want to take my hat off to the Clark Board uh, immediately. Uh, I went to them and said we have two rural regions, and if we don't give them at least a floor of $500,000, we won't have enough money to really get people to believe we can create supportive housing. So, but our five regions uh, will receive the, the Nevada Housing Division will operate an annual grants round, and to that grant round will come people with experience and talent in housing development and property management, people with experience and talent in supportive services. Uh, some people, like the Empowerment Center, who will meet today, do both. Catholic Charities does both. Others will create partnerships. Those joint applications, housing and services, will come to the annual competition round. The use of funds can be as needed for rental assistance to make this deep subsidy available to disabled persons, for services, filling services gaps. We are adding to the bill by amendment the ability to do acquisition and rehabilitation. Uh, you have in Clark County the Safari Motel project. That is one where funds were used to purchase a very large motel on Fremont Street and convert it into, I believe it is, uh, transitional supportive housing. It isn't intended to be permanent, but it's an example of the win-win of community redevelopment and creating supportive housing at the same time. Um, again, this grants round will be awarded, administered, and performance reviewed by the Nevada Housing Division. They do an amazing job every year with what's called the qualified Qualified Allocation Plan, the QAP process. They did an amazing job with Home Means uh, Nevada. So um, on the Grants Review Committee uh, uh, will sit a member of the Regional Behavioral Health Board and also 
a representative of a county within that region. So I pretty much told you all the words here, and we'll move on. <laughs> so here, before I get to a little more detail, uh, you're going to meet today Roxanne and Yvette, but I just wanted you to see what this success looks like. They took a disused motel on South Virginia Street, used to be at the edge of town, now town has grown past it, and they converted it into a residential uh, addiction treatment and recovery center for women, and then they went on and built uh, using, I believe, low-income housing tax credits. What you see on the right there, Marvel Way, absolutely beautiful. They have NA on site, they have AA on site, they have a uh, uh, problem solver uh, workforce developer on site, they have a group therapy room on site, they're putting in a medical room, and it's, it is recovery housing, no substance use on site. So that's an example of, I, there are some similar examples, Catholic Charities in Clark County has permanent supportive housing already. We, we just need a lot more. Um, so moving on, I wanted to address the amendments, and I apologize to the whole world uh, that the amendment is still finding its way to Nellis, but you have it. Um, so in Section 17, through the result of a lot of stakeholder meetings, we uh, have greatly streamlined the bill. We used to have an application process with Housing Division and a different one with Department of Health and Human Services. Health and Human Services themselves, uh, as well as the housing authorities, we decided a consolidated application is better. So thank you, HHS, but you have left the bill. Uh, so consolidated application process, adding acquisition and rehab up to $15,000 per unit, adding the county voice in funding decisions, uh, requiring that and this is something that Shar and I, and I would like to discuss with the board, maybe we will remove this. Tenancy means that you have a lease agreement. You have a right to that home. Uh, typically, they are 12-month uh, leases, but we have said you can't, you haven't, you must offer a minimum of 24 months of tenancy. Perhaps that should come out, and perhaps it should be uh, uh, no time limitation at all. Um, Here's something that is important. We can't bring the capital funding to create the actual apartment building without those apartment builders having in their pro forma 15 years of commitment of the rental assistance that's needed and the support of services dollars that's needed. That's why these are three-year grants with up to four-year renewals. If you're successful, you are in this game uh, for uh, 15 years. And then another amendment is that any unallocated funds become carryover. So that's what I just said. Uh, Section 18, I just want to make the point about leveraging. If you are to be a recipient of housing stability funds, you must apply for other assistance for which you are eligible. For example, you must get on the waiting list so eventually you move to a HUD-funded voucher opening up a critical need state-funded voucher for someone else. Um, the one change to definitions I want to point out to you is in section six. We added post-traumatic stress disorder or other debilitating trauma. We want to make sure we had made it very clear that uh, veterans in our communities who are suffering PTSD or other victims of violence who are also suffering uh, PTSD are eligible uh, to receive uh, supportive housing and services. Um, our definition of supportive housing is very different from the original bill, much improved by our collaboration with folks who, uh, to whom this is very central. Homeless people are central to this definition, but it also allows serving the, in, the intellectually uh, IDDD community, intellectually and developmentally disabled communities, as well as homeless folks. Um, and then I just close this core presentation thanking you for your time, thanking all of the stakeholders whom we have met with, and leaving you with Governor Lombardo's words, with which we at NAMI and the stakeholders could not agree 
uh, more. So we are hopeful that together we can find different answers than incarceration to addiction and mental illness. We suggest that answer is supportive housing and housing stability. So uh, thank you very much, and we are ready for questions. Thank you for that. Members, questions on the bill? Senator Spearman. Thank you. Um, so Ms. Adler, I was trying to think, did you say $160? to a $400,000 home? Yes, it, the critical needs fee that you would pay as part of your real property transfer tax would be $160. And, and in your first month mortgage payment, Senator, you would pay uh, $279 in principal. So in your first month mortgage, you have, you have created equity for your family that is more than the fee that you would have paid to help contribute to housing needs across our state. Okay. And I think you mentioned it, though. This does include veterans? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Senator Gansert. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I was looking at the 15000 to rehab a property. Is that 15000 for a property or for each unit of a property? For each unit, Senator. Okay. Thank you. If I may add, um, the Safari Motel project somehow accomplished acquisition rehab with a little less than 15K a unit. Don't know how they did that. What the idea here is to encourage local governments, for example, or the state to put forward community development block grant funds that could act as, so critical needs fills the gap that CDBG leaves. Um, thank you. I do have a follow-up. Is that okay? So, you know, in, in thinking about those dollars, I know the Home Meets Nevada dollars, the, the $500 million, there was a set of criteria that was used to basically prioritize projects because they were over-subscribed or so many people applied for those. And so I don't know if you've thought through how you would allocate funds given li limited resources. And, and just to point out, the Home Meets Nevada funds, they never actually put in the dollars per unit. So... Um, some projects could be spending $300,000 per unit, and some could be spending, you know, $100,000 per unit, but that wasn't a criteria, so sort of the return on investment. And so I don't know whether you've thought through those or if you uh, are looking to establish those through uh, statute or regs or the boards themselves. Thank you. I um, uh, apologize. Through you, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to Senator Gansert. Um, the Home Means Nevada dollars, uh, I really have not, I don't have deep knowledge about the funding decisions. What I do know, though, is that that funds, the, if you will, the, the apartment building, the bricks and mortar, but I have had communications with recipients of those building dollars who are eager for the opportunity to have the deep rental subsidies so that you know very low income people can afford to live there and the services dollars that would come from here. Um, thank you. And just so my question would be if you've thought about how you prioritize if there's if you're uh, there's far more applications than resources available. So um, the bill allows for a regulation to be developed and uh, the Nevada Housing Division every year, for example, when they develop the qualified allocation plan, they have a great way of reaching out to stakeholders to get input to then create a priority point system. And that is what I would anticipate would happen. Senator Dignate. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, you know, before I ask my question, I think I just want to mention for the record, um, both to you, Ms. Adler, and of course to Ms. Frost, how courageous it is to even come and discuss this issue. I think that many of us who work in the public health space recognize the urgency of addressing this issue, um, specifically for the folks like those in my district that suffer from this issue. And, you know, when we talk about addressing the social determinants of health, this is, this is it, right? This is, this is the, the actual delivery of how we can uh, look at what folks go through in their homes and how that can lead to health outcomes, right? That is the entirety of, of what we do and why this is important. Um, I think for me, the most important question perhaps is, you know, in speaking on this issue, have you had the conversation on, 
you know, maybe closing the loophole for real property transfer tax. Has that been a discussion that you've had in any conversations? And is, is that of interest? I think that's probably the most important thing for myself. Uh, Senator Donate, Sarah. you may be <coughs> referring to um, the statutory opportunity that, uh, for example, casinos have to transfer property uh, and not engage with the real property transfer tax. Um, if that was what you were referring to, we have not touched that conversation around SB 68. That is a statutory uh, tool that they use, and we, we haven't touched it. Thank you. Sarah, this, um, this is Char Frost for the record. Um, Senator, thank you for the question, Senator Donate. That's actually, um, I have had some conversations um, in the background, and um, because that is a concern, I mean, this, that would be a tremendous, if that were to be closed, obviously this bill does not do that, but that would be even more money funneled into this critical needs fund. And so it is certainly something that I personally would be supportive of, um, and I believe there is a different bill coming forward related to that, but not from us. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any additional questions? So I had a question on the acquisition piece that was added. Um, and I think what I'm trying to get an understanding on, there's only going to be roughly maybe 18 to 20 million per year that would be generated from the proposed language in this bill. So penciling out a project such as the one that you showed, how much would it cost to do an entire unit and then rehab it? Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the question, because it gives me an opportunity to show you a lot of work that I've done. So <laughs> here, here is uh, the Nevada Housing Division estimates in the second year of the biennium $19 million based upon uh, five-year history. Uh, and so this is um, how uh, an HD takes 10% admin, and there's sufficient admin dollars to support the public housing authorities in their work as well. We would make sure that that happens. Um, so this is how the funds would then allocate by the five behavioral health regions. You see the minimum in 25% uh, in each bucket and the 50% remaining. And so, and then at the bottom of this screen, we estimate every critical needs dollar can be leveraged three times with other federal sources, HUD housing choice vouchers, for example. But here is what, to your question, this is how funds might flow through the critical, through the critical needs fund if, in Clark County, for example. So in year one, we have a peach rehab project and the critical needs fund puts up $15,000 per unit. If additional funds are needed, that would need to come from, again, CDBG, home dollars, county dollars. But what, we're, what our uh, belief is is kind of twofold. Rural Nevada, we could go a long way with $15,000 a unit, and that might be how we get to supportive housing. And then in urban Nevada, there are other sources of dollars that the critical needs fund could incent in order to do acquisition and rehab. But then as this chart shows you, this is, and I will provide this to you, this shows you how funds might flow with the three-year renewals. And this shows you at the end of six years, we might have created 1,300 additional supportive housing units. All right, thank you for that. Um, I don't see any additional questions, any, any additional questions, so what we'll do is open up for support. Uh, I don't know how many are here for support, but I know we have a nice amount in opposition. So what I'm going to do is change the three minute rule to two minutes, but if you come up in support, please fill in all three chairs. If you have support down south, I'm gonna start in Carson and then I'll go down south. If there's anyone down south, Fill in the three chairs.
And I will start with you, young lady with the black sweater. You got polka dots. Thank you. My name is Robin Reedy. I'm the executive director of NAMI Nevada. That's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And as I was thinking about this and, and writing out testimony, I thought to myself, this is the story I've been telling for five years. This is incredibly important when I started this position. The first calls in our helpline was for housing and for supportive housing. And it rings true with me because I am the daughter of someone who was diagnosed with schizoid affective disorder. So back then it was manic depressive with schizophrenic tendencies and today they call it schizoid affective. And my mother at varying times in her life was homeless. The only time my mother was stable was when an Ohio County bought an old hotel, made it into studios, and they fenced it so that the people in the hotel would be safe, not the other way around. And she stayed on her meds, and she was stable until the time of her death. We have so many buildings that can be rehabbed here and we have so many people who need a place to stay. And in the long run, when you're providing someone with a place to stay that needs it, you're saving money. You're saving tax dollars, they're not going into the emergency rooms. It is just a very practical thing. But imagine families not having to go through what we went through as children and as young adults having that home for someone. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello, my name is Abby. I am with the National Alliance on Mental Illness. At three years old, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I experienced rapid cycling with manic episodes. I had so much anxiety and sadness and anger at once. My favorite cartoon character is Taz because I felt I could spin just like him. By middle school, the mania turned to depression. I was bullied by other students, which led to bench eating. I went to multiple schools, promising resources and support that, mul that never materialized. At one school, the principal called me in to tell me I was hopeless and helpless and never gonna amount to anything every day. If you are emotionally abused every day, you start to believe what you hear is true. I tried, I attempted suicide at 10 years old. At the same time, I was going through a major medication adjustment, coming off 10 medications. The process took years and there was no support. Every day I was expected to attend school as if my body and mind were not in crisis. It was hard to stabilize my condition and I was hospitalized 13 times in one year. I needed more support than an outpatient program or an inpatient short-term hospitalization that I couldn't get. I needed a supportive living program to manage my symptoms and provide encouragement. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. My name is John Solomon. I'm a rural um, landlord. I, also, I live in Reno. I just sold three houses in Fallon, Nevada and bought one house in Reno and the taxes that are proposed here would have not affected any of those deals. In one, in one little bit. They're so small. Um, as a landlord, my biggest uh, expense is transitioning from one tenant to another. Um, what this bill would do is give someone who has lost their income a method of getting it back together so they wouldn't become homeless. Living in Reno, I have been working, uh, I'm a member of Faith in Action, and I work with my temple to feed homeless people once a week. Um, I just feel like it has to be done. 
what, what I've been very involved with homeless issues and I know that what we're doing right now in Reno is not providing any kind of solution to the problem. We're just offering temporary band-aids and we need something and you have to, I know enough about uh, properties to know you need to have capital to build places and this gives us an opportunity to build capital so that we can get people in a house. Thank you very much for your testimony. So I will go down south and then I'll come back up to Carson. Thank you for your testimony. So I will start with, well, you both have green, the lime green jacket. Turn on your mic and please state your name for the record. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Trin Dang. That's T-R-I-N-H-D-A-N-G. And I'm the executive director of NAMI Southern Nevada, a peer-led mental health organization. I'm also the daughter and granddaughter of family members with mental health challenges. As a teen, my grandmother who heard voices was often kicked out of her home. At 16, I would drive around from place to place trying to find her a suitable living space. She wasn't able to afford to live on her own and she wasn't able to live with my mother who was her only child. They would trigger each other leaving my mother hospitalized at times and it often made it being hard being home. There were many sleepless nights because my grandmother, awakened by her own demons and voices in her mind, would be up yelling in the middle of the night. I loved her dear, dearly, and though I did what I could to help her with the resources and knowledge that I had, NAMI being a huge support in being that knowledge and resource, but it didn't stop my suicidal ideations that started as a teen. Life often became too overwhelming, and I didn't know what to do. I had three younger siblings as well that I had to care for. When a family member is sick, it impacts the whole entire family unit, not just the individual that's that has a mental health condition. My grandmother was also our caretaker when my parents worked. And at times she was so loving and sweet, but she wasn't getting the help that she needed and we saw the other side of her sometimes. My grandmother is no longer here with us and just passed this October 2022. But there have been periods in my life where I hold this guilt, the thought of having to remove her and having the thought of removing her from my home because I had to choose between her and my own mental health. Luckily, over the years, being on a wait list, she was able to get into income-based housing for seniors, but it wasn't here. She ended up moving out of state, and I was grateful that she was able to have at least a safe home and a place to live. Unfortunately, for the many family members who come through our support groups and dozens of families who I've taught in our education classes, they don't always have these options. And families do end up having to remove their children and their family members out of their home, and it's heartbreaking. Every houseless individual is somebody's child. They have a family that at some point said, we can't do this anymore. Someone once said to me, our budgets reflect our values. This investment into supportive housing not only helps the individual experiencing mental health challenges, but the entire family unit and our communities at large. This is something that our community desperately needs, and we hear it from the hundreds of phone calls on our helpline and the hundreds of families and peers coming to us asking for more than what we can offer. This is something that will truly make a difference for our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next, in the center, and the black jacket. State your name for the record. <clears throat> My name is Dan, <clears throat> excuse me, Dan Rumelt, R-U-M-E-L-T, and I live in the southwest part of our valley here in Las Vegas. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity, um, Madam Chair and committee members, to express my support for uh, SB 68 today. Um, it's a problem, as has been noted earlier, earlier, that we see every day. Some looking out the windows of their homes and apartments, some walking down the street, some driving. We see it almost every day. When we have visitors on the strip, uh, it's hard to walk down the street or pedestrian overpasses without seeing uh, without seeing sometimes very desperate people who need help. Some ask for money, some don't. Some ask for food, some don't. Some are scary, admittedly, but most, most are not. Just driving through our local supermarkets, going in or out of the parking lots, we also encounter homeless people looking for help. 
On Sunday, I got an example that was especially apropos for this hearing. Um, we, I saw a man he was standing by his car. He had a sign about almost the size of his car talking about how he was about to be homeless, how he couldn't afford to feed his family and pay his rent. Um, I should have stopped and learned more about his situation, um, but it was startling to see. He, he wasn't asking for money. I don't know if it was an expression of his frustration or if he was just couldn't find any other way to, to, to tell the world about his problem. I did wonder, though, if one day we'll see him on the street or living in his car, uh, unable to pay rent and support his family. So if there's a, a, a case that uh, shows the need for Senate Bill 68, it would seem that uh, this, he was playing an amplified violin while he was making his case and, and letting his views known. But I'm wondering if uh, Violin Man will wind up on the street. Uh, but it would certainly be a good reason that we should look to support uh, this bill. Uh, I know that there's a, a lot of talk about the increase in taxes. It really is a drop in the bucket. Um, I know the $400,000 figure has been used. $160 would, would be added. Um, I don't think we can get a, a house in our neighborhood or a property for less than $500,000, but that would bring it all the way up to $200. Yet another drop in the bucket. And barely noticeable on the long list of items that already appear uh, on the uh, closing statements. Um, Sir. So we, anyway, I, I we, oh, sorry. We've reached the two minutes. My right? All right. Uh, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to express, to express my views before the committee today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, very down nice. south. Yes. I'm Could you turn on your mic, please? And state your name for the record. And state your name for the record. Sorry. I am Kathy Class, K L A S S, a small real estate investor, and I've been investing in Vegas since 1995. I retired here in 2017. Um, and I want to thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, for the opportunity to comment on this important bill concerning housing opportunities for homeless people. The majority of citizens and tourists in Nevada are concerned about the growing homeless population. The, this bill provides a reasonable, affordable opportunity for financial resources for creative housing solutions for the homeless population. As stated, on a $400,000 house, it would be $160 in transfer taxes, which will have little impact on future home buyers and provide important financial resources to, to begin addressing homelessness. This will allow many homeless and individuals to return to a better life. Many homeless people would like to work. With housing, they can explore training op opportunities. And I worked on the 1996 um, welfare reform bill and many of the people when we were looking at childcare said to me if they could just have transportation. So I know that if we got people houses or home, uh, a roof over their head, they would look at work. Nevada suffers from a massive labor, labor shortage which can be filled with people eager to work. It takes a leg up for people who have had setbacks. SB 68 will provide the leg up. SB 68 will also help homeless individuals who have issues that prevent them from functioning in a traditional environment. SB 68 is a creative way to provide much needed funds to curb homelessness, which impacts every resident and tourist in Nevada. It is small, it's a small one-time fee, which will have little notice by many home purchasers. Again, I want to express my strong support for this bill and I want to thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, back in Carson, I'll start with you with Grace Wedder. State your name for the record. Sarah Mahler, thank you. Um, I'm a 25-year resident of Spanish Springs. I've raised my family here in Nevada. I'm the mom of a person with developmental disabilities. Through no fault of her own, my daughter struggles with being able to work more than 15 hours a week while taking one online class at TMCC. At age 26, her heart's desire is to live independently in a safe, affordable, and comfortable place. That's not going to happen without financial support and appropriate services to help her with money management and day-to-day -day activities of independent living. 
My daughter wants to feel successful with supports in place so that she can be happy, live a full life, and feel good about herself. For so long, my daughter has felt less than her classmates and others in her age group. SB 68 will help individuals like my daughter who have a excuse me, developmental disability who want a safe place that they can call home and where they can have independence and support. Nevadans with developmental disabilities deserve to have housing assistance. I urge you to vote in favor of SB 68 to help this grossly underserved population. I'd also like to thank uh, Sarah Adler and NAMI and the individuals that came today in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. I am Sandy Staymates, and I'm a volunteer with the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm also a member of our Walshaw Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board, and we are happy to support SB 68. We, um, we know the need is great. Supportive housing will make a big difference in Nevada. So thank you. Uh, we are very grateful to Clark Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board for being, bringing this bill forward, and we strongly support it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, esteemed committee members, Scott Rutledge with Argentum Partners. I'm here today on behalf of Hope Link of Southern Nevada. I also happen to have the honor of serving as the board chair for that organization. Uh, we've been serving our population in Southern Nevada for 31 years. Um, there is no uh, simple solution to prevention of homelessness or to try to house folks that are experiencing homelessness. I think that SB 68 goes a long way in addressing some of the individuals who do unfortunately fall through the cracks. Uh, one of the things we do with our organization is not only do we help get people into housing, we help them with through our career link programs and other wraparound services. Not everyone that we can house is gonna have the capacity to be able to go on and, and earn uh, more income in order to stabilize themselves and so this bill goes a long way to helping solve part of that issue. So again, Scott Rutledge with our gentleman on behalf of Hope Link in support of SB 68. Thank you for your testimony. I'll go ahead and take you and then I'm going to go down south. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Serena Evans and I'm the policy director for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. According to the National Network to End Domestic Violence, access to safe and affordable housing is often reported as the most significant barrier to leaving an abusive relationship. And while safe housing can provide pathways to freedom, many roadblocks make safe housing unattainable. Because of co-occurring co financial abuse, many victim survivors of power-based violence have little to no savings, poor credit, and live on the margins or in extreme poverty. This bill has the opportunity to change lives and create supportive services that are currently lacking and non-existent in the state. We especially appreciate section 12 of this bill, which includes those recovering from trauma and the definition of who would qualify for supportive housing services. Victim survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and trafficking are recovering from ongoing and pervasive trauma, which increases their risk for PTSD, substance abuse, and other mental illnesses, such as um, depression and anxiety. Additionally, of homeless women, 57% cite domestic violence as the immediate cause of their homelessness. I think we have heard throughout the testimony today that resources are lacking in this state. SB 68 seems like a no common sense measure and we urge its passage. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, state your name for the record. My name is Kathy Baxt, B-A-K-S-T. Thank you, Madam Chair and the committee for this opportunity to support SB 68. I have lived and worked in Carson City for 46 years and raised four sons here. I am a retired elementary school teacher and am presently a caregiver and guardian for my son, Jamie. I am a founding board member of NAMI Western Nevada, and NAMI is a National Alliance on Mental Illness. My son, Jamie, is 40 years old. He is suffering from severe mental illness. He used to work as a tattoo artist in Carson City. He owned his own business for 10 years. However, he now suffers from schizophrenia and co-occurring addictions, and he cannot work. He is med compliant and participates in the ACT program in Carson City and attends peer support groups. He lives on $970 a month from Social Security Disability Insurance. 
Unfortunately, Jamie cannot take care of himself, and due to his illness, um, he would be living on the streets or dead if I have not taken guardianship of him in 2013. He cannot parent his two daughters, one of who is 18 years old and goes to Carson High School. And his illness is not curable with medications or therapy. Schizophrenia is a permanent brain disorder. The solution for my son and many others like him is permanent supportive housing, where housing, support systems, and job training can help build a person up and make them a more productive uh, part of Nevada's community. I am taking care of him now. I'm 73 years old. I cannot do it uh, forever. Thank you for time and your attention to this critical issue. I am in support of SB 68. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Hi, yes, thank you, Madam Chair, as well as the committee for allowing me to speak today in support of SB 68. My name is Angela Tullison, T-O-L-L-I-S-O-N. I'm a retired school psychologist, as well as a family member, a loved one um, with schizophrenia, my oldest son, Andrew. We've been on a journey for the last 10 or so years um, after he was diagnosed. He was a 4.0 student and he was completing his last semester and last class in a nursing program in California before he became ill. Um, up until that time, he had been typically developing and um, was on his way to a career. After that time, uh, my family and I needed to begin to love and accept and understand the new person in our lives. Because as we know, schizophrenia is a brain disorder. It causes many personality changes. One of them is also the inability to understand they're ill. So this impacts compliance for medications. This is where I lead to SB 68. In one of my son's um, episodes with non-compliance for medication, he became uh, unusually aggressive and agitated and had to be hospitalized. He was only there for a couple days before um, I was asked to come get him. Still reeling from the trauma and the experience, I was very unsure about having him come home because I feared my safety. However, there was no alternative between the hospital and the streets. There was no step-down program to help him get himself on his feet. With SB 68, he would have that support where he could get medical management and then move on from there and move towards independence. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today on SB 68. Thank you for your testimony. So I will go down south. Um, I'll start with the woman in the yellow shirt. Hello, I'm Ashley Floyd, that's F-L-O-Y-D, and I am the program director for NAMI Southern Nevada, that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And in my role, I'm both a peer as someone with four mental health conditions and a family member with six family members that are diagnosed. I come today to share some of the experiences of the participants that attend our support groups, that call our helpline, that participate in our classes, that share a commonality, a very big commonality, and that is their loved one or themselves not being able to have housing and to get the wraparound services they need to maintain and sustain their living. We have family members when we have our support groups that 50% of the families in those support groups, support groups averaging 20 people a meeting, are individuals who are concerned for the ability of their loved ones to have housing. A common issue that occurs with families and peers as they live together is family, the peers end up having um, episodes that interfere with their ability of the family members to feel safe in their homes. And safety is security. It gets to the point for one of our family members where they actually had to choose to move out of their house because their loved one would not leave it. And they, even if they tried to get the person removed, there's laws that prohibit that. So in order to make sure their loved one was safe and they were safe, they moved out of their home and rented an apartment. We had family member that son kept getting, having issues and being on the street, coming home, being on the street. And they were excited when he would be in jail. 
because they knew he was safe and he wasn't a harm to them. And the challenge with all of that is, is, it, is the jail the best place for someone to be when they really need help? One thing about SB 68 that's really valuable is that it's a, it's a bill that addresses the supported housing needs of our individuals who have mental health challenges that uh, don't allow them to sustain it on their own. And so that's the unique, beautiful thing about the bill and the part that people can have a home and not know how to maintain living in that home. And people who have greater access to services where they are are more likely to use them and benefit from them. So I'm a big supporter for SB 68, for our peers that attend our programs, our families that attend, and to my own family. Anybody, It's just something that it is a common sense thing, and, and we're really grateful for the opportunity to talk with you today about that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will go to the um, gentleman sitting next to you. Good afternoon. Uh, Regis Whaley, for the record, R-E-G-I-S-W-H-A-L-E-Y. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Research at Three Square Food Bank, and I'm happy to speak today in support of SB 68. Uh, what I want to share today is some data from the U.S. Census Bureau's Household Poll Survey data that is uh, surveying households directly, and I want to speak specifically about Nevada households today, looking at how the lack of access to critical needs, such as housing and food, uh, might contribute negatively to uh, mental health in Nevada, and consequently how uh, providing access to critical needs can improve mental health in Nevada. So again, uh, the data that I'm speaking about today is the U.S. Household, U.S. Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey data. This looks at how aspects of American life have changed over the course of the pandemic, and I want to speak today specifically about food security, housing security, and uh, mental health. Uh, there are two measures of mental health in this survey, one of them being about anxiety, the other being about depression. Uh, when you look at how uh, those two measures of mental health uh, compare with housing security, uh, what we see is that um, in asking households about their likelihood of being evicted from their house if they're currently behind on their rent or mortgage, as you look at those households that say that they are uh, not at all likely to be evicted and then work your way down to those that are, say that they are very likely to be addicted or evicted, uh, the um, they are those households that are uh, reporting very likely to be evicted uh, report uh, nearly double the rate of screening positively for uh, generalized anxiety disorder and nearly three times as high for major depressive disorder. We see a similar pattern with respect to food insecurity. Uh, households that uh, report uh, food insecurity are uh, the highest level of food insecurity, I should say, are four times more likely to report being uh, or screening positively for anxiety and five times more likely to report uh, being uh, screening positively for depression. So we see the same pattern with these critical needs of housing and food, that as households become uh, go higher on that spectrum of experiencing more food insecurity or more housing insecurity, they're more likely to experience poor mental health. The reason that we as the food bank want to support SB 68 is because we know that access to those critical needs that all come together under supportive housing are what help to create a healthier and stronger Nevada communities. And literally brings them under one roof, pun intended, uh, to be able to support um, what we need to see in our communities. So for that reason, uh, Three Square stands behind SB 68. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So we will come up uh, to Carson City and we'll start with you. Thank you so much. My name is Roxanne DiCarlo, and I'm the Executive Director for the Empowerment Center. The Empowerment Center is a drug and alcohol treatment program for women. Um, we're located um, in South Reno. Uh, in uh, the end of 2022, we opened up our very first supportive housing um, apartment complex right over by Meadowood Mall, so centrally located and easily accessible. Um, this is the first affordable housing complex that will provide supportive uh, support systems for people in early recovery from a substance use disorder. It's the first of its kind in Nevada, and, um, and we are super proud to bring it to our community. Um, one of the things that we've noticed, and although we received um, funding, affordable housing funding, to build the structure, um, Nevada um, provided most of those supports, Washoe County, um, we're really um, we're really pleased to receive those, but uh, the the needs, the funds needed to supply the actual support systems um, that are in place, I found lacking. Um, I looked for different areas, um, you know, local foundations, um, SAPTA, um, the Bureau of Behavioral Health, 
uh, for funding to um, provide those services. And, um, and I have found the funds for this year, but that's where it kind of ends. And then I'll continue to, to look for those um, fundings um, year after year. Uh, a SB 68 would allow us to have ongoing funds on a regular basis that would um, really secure the, um, those support systems in areas like that. Um, the other, the other thing I just wanted to talk about is one of the things that we did at the Empowerment Center is building a, um, a, a solar system to be able to relieve the um, cost of electricity and being able to reallocate those funds to provide those services. So those are really prime examples of how funding through SB 68 would be um, a support and help to our community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the community, committee. My name is Joan Hall, president of the Nevada Rural Hospital Partners, here today in support of SB 68. Rural hospitals have challenges with readmissions of patients with chronic conditions. Through a community paramedicine grant that we received, we discovered that many of these patients had housing needs that the providers were totally unaware of, such as electrical issues, no hookups to water or sewer, or even unsafe access to their own homes. This bill allows for renovation and weatherization of these homes, and this is funding that is, would be most helpful to these rural Nevadans. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Good afternoon, Chair Neal, members of the committee. My name is Jimmy Lau, and I'm the Vice President of Ferrari Reader Public Affairs representing Dignity Health St. Rose Dominican. Uh, St. Rose is the largest not-for-profit healthcare system down in Southern Nevada, operating seven acute care hospitals throughout the Las Vegas Valley. Um, one of the prongs of St. Rose's advocacy is addressing social determinants of healthcare, uh, which is why we are here in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Hello, my name is Elise Monroy Marsala with Bell's Case Government Affairs. I'm here today on behalf of the Nevada Psychiatric Association and the Nevada Primary Care Association. Stable housing is a major social determinant of health to ensuring um, positive health outcomes for people, so being able for folks to access and sustain um, stable housing is important. We also heard about the need today for supportive housing. So for these reasons and the others stated on the record today, we support this bill and would urge the committee support. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y, C-O-L-E, former inpatient chief of staff of Northern Nevada Adult Mental Health Services. Um, homelessness does not cause mental illness, but mental illness is sadly associated with homelessness. Um, Dark Days, Bright Nights by Matthew O'Brien talked about the people living under this, the streets of Las Vegas in storm drains. Here in Northern Nevada, when I was at Nevada Mental Health, what I was shocked was to find 30 to 50 people living under the Glendale Bridge over the Truckee River between Nevada Mental Health and the Grand Sierra Resorts. Um, this often delayed discharge because I couldn't find a stable way to discharge people into unstable environments. And in terms of cost, hospitalization costs more than the amount of the transfer tax being shown up here. More importantly, I had to change how I prescribe medication. I can't give somebody a 30-day discharge amount of medication if they have no permanent address. I have to reduce the prescription to, say, a seven-day prescription, which means it has to be repeatedly refilled. Um, schizophrenia is a 1% probability in your lifetime. Major depression is 25%. Substance use disorder is 8%. I was shocked recently working in northern Arizona on a job site to find that many of my patients lacked running water, electricity, indoor toileting, were relying on chopped wood for heat. This is the United States of America in 2022. It's the same in Nevada for many of our rural Confederates. The NPA supports Senate Bill 68. I support it, and I certainly hope you will support it as well. I think we can make a big difference with stable housing, and we're not turning Nevada into a welfare state. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Yes, Madam Chair, my name is Hope Tingle, just like it feels, T-I-N-G-L-E. And I am here in support of SB 68. Um, our church is one of the partners for the Night Off the Streets Shelter. 
and my younger brother often volunteers to cover shifts at that shelter. And I don't know how you're liking northern Nevada winter right now, but um, it's a bit of a challenge for the folk who are out on the street with nowhere to go. So um, by hopefully putting in um, some supportive housing that can help f folk with um, care, mental health care, enabling services, such as the fish development that's going on on North Carson Street, I think that uh, it's something that we need to really start taking into consideration because when I stroll around town with my dog and I see the number of homeless folk out on the streets every day, I just think um, this is a very, very important bill and the cost-benefit analysis, I think, proves out that this would be something of serious impact to this state and I think that it's something that you all really need to consider and thank you so much for allowing me to testify here. Thank you for your testimony. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Senator Neal and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Valerie Haskin, V-A-L-E-R-I-E. H-A-S-K-I-N. I am the Rural Regional Behavioral Health Coordinator and I'm here today on behalf of the Rural Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board who is in support of SB 68 with the proposed amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello members of the committee and chair. My name is Marco Rauda. Um, I am with um, El Faro Consulting but I'm here on my own. Um, I was a member of the Southern Nevada Housing Regional um, Housing Authority from 2011 to 2015, and we discussed all of these issues way back in the day. For that matter, I remember, well, and you know, here we are today, right? But uh, um, I remember when Veterans Millage, Village opened up in Southern Nevada. It was probably the proudest moment of my tenure at the uh, Housing Authority. Um, you know, the federal government helps at times in housing, but it, it just doesn't happen often. And we need to secure a revenue source in order for us to mitigate these issues. I believe that SB 68 can help with that. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I'm going to disappoint some people. So you two will be the last physical, and then I have to go to the phone lines, and then I have to switch to opposition because we actually do have a second bill, and I cannot move that second bill. So... Um, I will go to you first in the gray sweater. My name is Laura Yanez, and that's L-A-U-R-A Yanez, Y-A-N-E-Z. And I'd like to thank the committee for being allowed to speak today. My name, I am the executive director for NAMI Western Nevada, which is the rural affiliate. Uh, we also run the statewide warm line. It's amazing the number of calls that we get. The warm line is a peer support line for individuals experiencing mental illness as well as individuals experiencing life stressors. Many of our calls are about people who are resource challenged and a lot of those calls have to do with housing instability. We know that housing plays a critical factor in people's ability to recover and their ability to move forward especially working in rural Nevada we see that there is a shortage of housing and the importance of supported housing I'm also a family member of an individual who has schizophrenia who's currently living on the streets and what happens is his lack of housing leads him to live on the streets where instead of taking his meds, he starts to self-medicate. He then ends up incarcerated, which is the only time our family truly knows where he's at. My brother would directly benefit from supported housing to have the supports that he needs in order to stay in recovery and to be a productive member of our community. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Heidi McKendree, M-C-K-E-N-D-R-E-E. -E -E. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Reno Housing Authority. I'd like to thank the committee today for the opportunity to testify in support of SB 68. As the Public Housing Authority serving Washoe County, the Reno Housing Authority and its Board of Commissioners support SB 68, which will create a critical needs fund to support housing stability, um, supportive housing, and supportive services to very low-income Nevadans. 
the global pandemic demonstrated how fragile stable housing is to those with the lowest income. The federal government asked quick, acted quickly to address the eviction crisis and assist households struggling to pay rent during the pandemic. With the pandemic behind us, we now see how close to homelessness many of our community members are, especially those with the lowest and most unstable income. <coughs> SB 68 provides an avenue to provide housing stability and supportive housing and services to Nevadans for the long run. We are all aware that affordable housing has become a national crisis. Supportive housing is the most needed housing type in the spectrum of affordable housing. Existing funding opportunities rarely fund direct supportive services, leaving nonprofits and government agencies trying to find, um, find funding for services wherever they can. Additionally, now that housing stability has been demonstrated to be a serious issue for low-income households, the need for funding so to support alternatives to the more limited traditional rental subsidy programs is critical. Housing authorities have demonstrated during the pandemic that we are the ideal mechanism to distribute this funding by ensuring fast and effective distribution and reporting on the funds. The Reno Housing Authority alone distributed $28 million in emergency rental assistance funding, um, as well as emergency rental assistance one funding. Okay. Um, on behalf of the Reno Housing Authority, we are ready to effectively deploy this much needed housing stability assistance that SB 68 will provide. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we're gonna go to the phone line, and what I'm going to tell you is that if you are an, a person on the phone line who is with NAMI, um, we have heard compelling testimony from existing NAMI members. So I'm going to allow you to say ditto if you're NAMI, not repeat, uh, not say that you're with NAMI. It's not any disrespect, but I think you guys have shown up in great numbers, and I respect that. So uh, BPS, I'm going to go to the phone line and support, but please, please, please say ditto. Um, and if you're NAMI, then turn in your written comments and we will upload those into the record. So BPS. Thank you, Chair Neal. To testify in support on Senate Bill 68, please press star nine on your phone or raise hand in your Zoom window to take your place in the queue. Caller, please press star six on your phone to unmute. You are unmuted. Please Good afternoon, proceed. members of the committee. My name is Sean O'Donnell. I'm the resident of Las Vegas, and I'm the executive director of Foundation for Recovery. We are a Nevada statewide organization governed, organized, and run by people and families recovering from substance use disorder. Our organization is here today in support of SB 68. Sustained recovery and tackling the chronicity of addiction requires a community effort, employment, health services, opportunities for social connection, and most importantly, a place to call home. The primary barrier to sustaining recovery for the participants in our program is sustainable housing support. Of the hundreds of individuals we see annually, only about 20% are stably housed, only 20%. To paint a better picture of these individuals, these are mostly individuals who are already engaged in treatment, who have recently completed treatment or who have been released from incarceration. How can we expect people to sustain their recovery or the benefits from treatment programs if they do not have a place to live and continued recovery support services? Our support workers continually express frustration locating safe and supportive housing for our program participants. The primary barriers are federal constraints and complex eligibility criteria with existing housing programs in Nevada. I can tell you that during my own recovery journey, I've personally experienced this gap. Following a residential treatment, I worked part-time at a retail store and I lived in my car in the parking lot of my employer. I was 19 at the time and the lack of supporting housing ultimately meant returning to drug use, continually utilizing costly services like emergency departments and going through the revolving door of treatment services. Thankfully, at that time, we were not experiencing the overdose crisis or fentanyl-contaminated drug supply like we are today. Otherwise, I'd likely be dead. 
The modest increase in the real estate transfer tax to support this critical needs fund will keep people from falling back into their addiction by preventing us from returning to an unsupported and dangerous living environment or going back to the streets. Ca it will incentivize caller. new housing options, caller. increase community collaboration, and help close the gap in our existing housing infrastructure. Please support SB 68. Thank you. Thank you for your commentary. So I'm in BPS, anyone on support? I want to strongly and deeply encourage you to say ditto. Um, BPS, is there anyone else on the line for support? We will take your written Thank you, Chair. Yes, commentary. we do have okay. continued. We do have continued support callers. One okay. moment, please. Caller Eager unmuted, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Neal and members of the committee. My name is Ben Innes, that is B-E-N-I-N-E-S-S. -S. I'm the coalition coordinator for the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance and we write in support of Senate Bill 68 to create a revenue stream for support of housing and housing stability. Uh, for some context, the NHJA, Nevada Housing Justice Alliance, is a coalition of grassroots organizers and community advocates, including the ACLU of Nevada, Battle Born Progress, Faith and Action Nevada, For Our Future Nevada, Las Vegas Democratic Socialists of America, as well as Northern Nevada Democratic Socialists of America, the Nevada Homeless Alliance, and the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada, plus more. And we work directly with Nevada tenants to develop solutions and advocate for community investments that solve the root causes of housing insecurity. Our work is based on the belief that housing is a human right and that home serves a higher purpose than just shelter. Um, I will echo and ditto all the points that have um, been said today. Um, costs of living are incredibly high. Our state's continuums of care are lacking. Too many families uh, are on the precipice of crisis and becoming unsheltered, and those who are, are unsheltered don't have the resources they need. So prioritizing the housing first strategies found in this bill is an effective and evidence-based solution to protecting housing stability in our communities. By creating a sustainable revenue stream for supportive housing, Senate Bill 68 will build on and better support the meager resources we have to fill the gaps in order to prevent at-risk individuals from further slipping through the cracks. Nevada desperately needs to create stable and sustainable housing that is both supportive and affordable. Senate Bill 68 will work toward just that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. So BPS and the callers that are on for support, I am I understand the compelling um testimony, but I am going to have to close support. We've given almost an hour to support. It was 20 minutes for the presentation, and I need to switch to opposition. I'm going to strongly encourage you to send in your written testimony to the committee secretary. The information is on the agenda. Um, we will make sure that um, your testimony is uploaded for the record so everyone can read it. I deeply apologize. I did not think that this hearing would go to this level. Um, so I am going to close support testimony and I'm going to shift to opposition because I need to give folks, I think you guys have presented a compelling case. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and move to opposition on SB 68. If there's anyone in the room in Carson City in opposition of XB 68. I need you to come and fill in these three chairs. If there's anyone down south that is in opposition of SB 68, I need you to fill in the chairs. I need you guys to do the two minutes. Um, if you're just like, I hate this bill, just say I hate this bill. <laughs> and um, And then we can go from there because we do have a second presenter and um, I just apologize to everyone. I didn't realize it would go this way. I will start with, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Janine Hansen. I'm the state president of Nevada Families for Freedom. Taxation is destroying the middle class. We oppose all tax increases, including SB 68. This bill increases the real property transfer tax from $1.95 per 500 evaluation or fraction thereof by 20 cents per 500. The average cost of a home in Nevada, according to Zillow in January 2023, was $409,000. That means that the tax transfer tax goes up from $1,595 plus the 20 cent increase of 163 to $1,758. 
<clears throat> on the average home. According to the Institute for Policy Innovation in the United States, the total U.S. tax burden, including federal, state, and local taxes and hidden taxes, is equal to 56% of an annual person's consumption spending. 56% is more than a person spends on housing, food, health care, transportation, education, and recreation. How can people possibly take care of themselves and our families when government takes 56% of our income. Government taxation is a major cause of family financial distress. No wonder more people are slipping into poverty. In addition, consider inflation, which according to John Williams at Shadowstat Government Statistics, is running at 16.5 as of April 22. If you use the methodology the government used before 1980 to configure the consumer price index, families are struggling just to buy food because federal government caught but because of federal government caused inflation. SB 68, the real property transfer tax, will make it more expensive for families to buy a home. We oppose this tax increase. Help families, no more taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Next. Richard Schock, uh, real estate broker, development planner, trustee for the Guernsey Trust, and business broker. Uh, 40 years in the business, I have uh, uh, done uh, affordable housing projects. I've worked with the Housing Authority in California, and I agree with everything that everybody's said so far that we need this type of housing, period. I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't agree with that issue. What I have here, I just want to ask a couple of questions, if I may. I'm, I'm in front of the uh, Finance Committee, Revenue and Finance Committee here. Do you have a performa of projections of how much money that you actually need to solve all these problems? I think that's a question for the bill presenter. I don't, okay. I'm not, yeah. Okay, all right. It's a very <laughs> important issue, here's why. Because <clears throat> I think there's another source that you can go at. We can have a win-win here for the whole state of Nevada to where we can get affordable housing up and built and it's right before our eyes. Just recently, uh, and it's very fortunate in the state of Nevada, that Tesla has decided to do another project. They're going to put $3.6 billion into this economy. They're going to do two more projects. They're going to have 9,000 more jobs. Where they're going to live, we'll get to that later. <clears throat> but what, now what's happened, it's my understanding, that our governor has, has actually only given them a 33% tax advantage over about a $1. billion overall tax that they're going to produce in this state over the next 20 years. Okay, let's do the math. That's why I wanted the math. If, they, if we just gave away $330 million out of $1 billion, how much taxes are still coming? $770 million. What they did, they just lowered the tax rate for Tesla from 7.7 .7 down to 5.25, protecting schools, which is a great plan. This is like a finding a new gold mine in Nevada, having Tesla here. So, this money, sir, if you go and, and you take sir, your 32%. I, I appreciate that philosophical discussion on the how much money is still in the queue after what's been abated. but. We're actually at the two minutes and 10 seconds, and I need to move to the next person. Okay. Give me 20 seconds. Can I just uh, conclude this? I can't give you the 20 you didn't, seconds. You didn't even have any numbers for me. I'm, I'm kind of happy I don't do have numbers. I don't have any numbers for you because that's probably a question for the bill presenter to give you her numbers of what she's estimated. Estimated. I'm not going to give any numbers. Okay. Well, I'll just let me finish with a number for you. To settle on this number. Okay. If you took your 32% increase is what you're asking for, 32% tax increase, and you apply 32% to the 770 million that they're going to pay taxes anyway, how much money would you have? I'll give you the figure. This money is coming in. It's new money, and it's got, and you can put it into affordable housing. You don't have to tax somebody in a house. 
that's going to sell, this contributes to everybody because everybody's concerned about this. I appreciate the remark. Um, well, and just I think understand. About it. Okay. okay. I have thought about a lot of things number. concerning this. Here's bill. the number $245,120,000. million dollars that okay. equals over a 20 year period, $12,256,000 a year. You could put that into affordable housing and it's new money coming. It's like finding a gold mine. You don't have to tax the people on the sale of a house. Okay. You're miss I think you're missing I, the, no, you're I'm on actually, the wrong horse. No, I'm actually not missing the point. I just, I'm giving the bill a hearing and I'm trying to be fair to present an idea that is presented in SB 68. Okay. That is not saying that I am an, in support or in opposition, but the legislature is about hearing ideas, not about penalizing the idea that's being presented. Opposition is great. I understand opposition. Okay. Thank you for your commentary. Thank I appreciate it. Mr. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dylan Keith, Assistant Director of Government Affairs at the Vegas Chamber. We are in opposition of the bill today, uh, not only for its increase of the real estate property transfer tax, but also for its handling of funds. We believe that funds of this nature should, be or should not be handled by an appointed regional board, but by elected officials to make sure that these funds are accountable and used correctly. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, so we will go ahead and do Fill in the chairs for opposition. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairwoman Neal and members of the committee. My name is Wiz Rizard. I'm the Deputy State Director with American for Prosperity. I, I do want to highlight what the gentleman said that I think anyone in this room hearing this story and seeing these problems uh, agree that they are a problem in our community. And I think uh, most people that are going to be here, like myself, opposing this bill is more so opposing the means and how we go about and solving that problem, I think the solution proposed here creates more problems. Uh, you know, when you talk about individuals looking to purchase homes, to put that, to take, to rob them of that ability to contribute to these causes by telling them that they have to pay this increase, uh, to me, uh, deprives the individuals of the ability to actually contribute. And I'll open up with the preamble of our Constitution because it is our North Star. It says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. So let me ask you this, because a preamble is more than two minutes. I, I understand. It's, I, it, it's, it's actually the first sentence because it's the most important. So, okay. Get to your key point, and I'm not trying to. It's just the reason why I am, um, because we really do have a second bill. Yes. Don't need to cite the preamble of the Constitution. Well, I don't need the preamble. Thank you. Get, go ahead and state the key point of your opposition because I still need to go down south. The preamble is the key point, Chairwoman. And in regards to that, it says here uh, to, uh, to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. That word promote is what I want to share here. Promote means when a society is doing well, government should encourage people to fill those gaps, to solve those problems in a charitable way. This bill robs individuals from having that experience and having ownership of that. If our goal is to help low-income families, we suggest that we can unlock the economy and help families by doing three things. Rein in and reform burdensome housing, land use and zoning regulations. Eliminate cronyism and tax subsidies for billionaires and corporations. And remove barriers like SB 68 that stand in the way of people pursuing their economic opportunities. And when you're talking about people pursuing purchasing a home and putting this burden, that is taking away that, that opportunity for them. And lastly, there was an incident that took place in Las Vegas where a gentleman through his own private endeavor looked to build tiny homes to address the homeless problems. And you know what the city did? Shut it down completely. When we're talking about zoning reform, this is what we're talking about. There are more sound solutions that build long-term solutions rather than using this platform to then tell people that they don't have a say and must pay a fee in order to solve a society problem. I greatly appreciate everyone who brought forward these issues and I appreciate the presenter and I appreciate you, Chairwoman, for giving everyone the opportunity to share their insight. Thank you and we urge you to oppose SB 68. Thank you for your testimony. 
Thank you, Chair Neal, members of the Senate Committee on Revenue and Economic Development. Uh, my name is Vincent Guthrow, it's spelled V-I-N-S-O-N, last name Guthrow, G-U-T-H-R-E-A-U, -E and I serve as the Executive Director of the Nevada Association of Counties, or NACO. Our members are all of 17 of Nevada's counties, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify on Senate Bill 68. Uh, first, our members understand the need for a more permanent uh, supportive housing solution, and our members do not have a position on the raising of the real estate property transfer tax. Our concern and opposition is regarding public dollars being distributed, awarded, and overseen by a, a policy, an appointed policy, not fiscal board. We believe that the responsibility lies with the local elected governing bodies. We appreciate the engagement from the sponsor of this bill, but we are still not there as far as being able to support this legislation as the lack of oversight and shift in tax policy and accountability remains, and so does our opposition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Nagel, for the record, N-A-G-E-L. My question is this, is that, you know, Franklin Roosevelt said that the government shouldn't do anything that the people should can do, because usually the people can do a better job. And we have uh, Fish in, in Carson City, we have Ron Woods, and we have several other charities that deal with homeless people and people who are in need of help. I really think that we're building up an industrial homeless complex by feeding this even more. And I think that the people should take care of this and people should donate and give this. My wife and I give quite generously to a lot of these charities every year, okay? I think the government needs to stick to their main job and let the people take care of the people as far as that goes. This is, again, you can't take that right away from us to help other people. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. I will go down south, uh, starting with the gentleman. I believe it's you have the gray jacket or gray and black. I can't thank, really thank see. Thank you, it. Madam. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, if I might, um, Keith Lynham, for the record, Keith Lynham, the chairman of the Legislative Committee for Nevada Realtors. With me today is Azim Jessa, the vice chair of the committee and the president of Nevada Realtors, Mr. Tom Blanchard. Uh, very much to quickly to the point, we appreciate your opportunity to let us uh, express some of our concerns that we've had with this bill. Um, we certainly are um, in favor of more affordable housing. Universally, we are in favor of that. In fact, we have been working for decades with local and state policymakers on increasing uh, the affordable housing in Nevada. Um, we have universally discovered one of the most efficient uh, ways of uh, additional uh, housing is increasing the inventory. Um, had we been asked, and we weren't, had we been asked how to increase affordable housing for all of those components of our society that have been outlined today, we would have said, why would it make sense to add to the seller's cost to bring those very homes to market? Um, it was with one of the most historically unbalanced, unproven, and unreliable taxes that we have, the Nevada Real Property Transfer Tax. Uh, it's also a sales tax. It is one of the most regressive taxes we have that hits hardest those that we are trying to help, the seniors, first-time home buyers, uh, the mentally challenged. All of those that we are trying to help today um, are harmed by this tax. Um, we, we feel that we should be sending out a lifeline, not a cinder block. We are at the table working towards affordable housing, and we are ready to help provide real solutions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Uh, my name is Azim Jessa with the Nevada Realtors Real as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm just here to speak to the fiscal notes as I was looking through um, the fiscal notes and it looks like there's a two, uh, excuse me, a 4.1 projected increase in the real property transfer tax revenues that this bill would provide uh, between 2022 and 2024. Um, just, you know, as Keith said, this is such a uh, volatile base. Um, we are actually, to give you some perspective, we are down 51.5% in real estate transactions this year. So to project a 4.1% increase is just completely out of line with reality, unfortunately. And again, another reason why, why taxing a single industry, uh, a single business, if you will, um, you know, home sellers and 
and that's you know a reason why that it is not a very good solution to funding this bill. Um, I agree. We we all need you know we understand all the issues, and we uh, we I mean my heart grieves for the folks that told their stories. Um, we just need a broader ba broader based, more stable tax base um, to provide the the things that our community does need. And the real property transfer tax is uh, just flat out a terrible way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Thank you, Chairwoman Neal. Tom Blanchard, State President of Nevada Realtors, and a 15-year paramedic. Having seen uh, the blight of homelessness on our streets, I can tell you it's been a problem uh, from 20, 30 years ago when I was out on the streets. The problem, as I see it, is that we have a broad-based problem that is trying to be fixed on one small, minute, little pinpoint uh, of a transaction. And we need to find a vehicle, and uh, the real property transfer tax is not it, but we need to find a vehicle where we can afford the, these kind of affordable housing. And we can start by trying to get some of the affordable land, the land that's out there, and get it to market at an affordable price so that they can build affordable homes. Because affordable land availability equates to affordable homes. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else down south in opposition? Fill in the chairs. And if your statement has already been made, can please say ditto? Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Chair, Chair Neal and members of the committee. My name is Ronald Naharo, for the record, R-O-N-A-L-D, N-A-J-A-R-R-O. And I'm the State Director for Americans for Prosperity. I'm also a resident of uh, Senate District 1. And I'm also a realtor and member of the National Association of Realtors. And we stand here today in, in opposition to SB 68 for a lot of the reasons we just heard my realtor colleagues say. You know, one of my missions and two of my missions in life is one, uh, making sure that we advance policies that allow folks to climb the economic ladder. And secondly, to make sure that our community members have access to the most powerful generation of wealth building the world has ever known, which is the purchase of their own property. It's also why it's the American dream. Unfortunately, I think raising the property tax like it was planned in this bill would do the opposite. It would discourage and hurt families that are first time home buyers trying to make a way and build that generation of wealth for their family. You know, as that community, as a Hispanic member in the community, uh, home ownership has made some gains in the Latino community, but we still lag behind. Uh, and this bill would only uh, further us away from the achievement of the American dream. It would also, there's a saying that goes, as the housing market goes, so does our economy. And we're already in a period where the market and the economy has slowed. This will only discourage economic uh, opportunity for those trying to sell homes and those also trying to buy homes. Additionally, this is just a tax. And as we know, taxes tend to be regressive and harm those that hurt, that, are, that we're trying to help the most. So I encourage you to please consider opposing SB 68 for the reasons uh, that I mentioned and the reasons said already. Thank you. Thank you for your commentary. Uh, I will go to the uh, woman. Okay. State your name for the record. My name is Susan Profit, P-R-O-F-F-I-T-T, -T, and um, I am the director of the Nevada Legislative Action Committee and the first vice president of the Nevada Republican Club. Um, thank you. I have to say thank you for addressing a serious medical need and trying to find a solution we can all agree is needed. I oppose it as, as it's written, however, due to the tax increase attached to it because Nevada has a $3 billion surplus already. And I think we can find some money in there for us. Um, I remember the day that my schizophrenic uncle and thousands more were asked to leave the mental facility when new civil rights related laws were passed in 1975 and 76. Until then I didn't know I had an uncle. These patients had no place to go when their families weren't able to care for them and some of them don't want you if you're ill. And um, so um, we, we need to resolve these issues humanely. We certainly do. But raising taxes won't fix bad laws. So historically, Nevada has passed bills to provide money for schools and homeless 
Yet no one has addressed the larger issue of transparency needed to ensure the money can only be used for its intended purpose. What, with that said, I respectfully request that you remove the tax portion of this bill so that conservatives like myself and others who see the need can get behind your efforts and support this bill that, that, that you want to pass. And please, find the time to address laws that were passed long ago that tied the family's hands when seeking help uh, to care for their loved ones. And please, address the waste and the all too familiar, we must spend it all this year mentality in government. The money is already there. It's just not being spent appropriately. Thank you for your testimony. Next. I thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my, my name is Al Rojas. I live in uh, uh, Assembly District 12, which is part of uh, Senate District 21. And uh, Senate District 2 and Senate District 10 are areas that I frequently visit and I am familiar with. I'm a retired electronics engineer with two patents. And I'm also a real estate owner and I come from a real estate family. Now, I totally understand that homelessness was going to decrease the value of your property. And controlling homelessness, especially in my area, is not only necessary, but I'm an advocate of it. However, as an engineer, the first thing you learn is if you can't measure anything, you can't control it. And I haven't seen any firm numbers that would say how many people we're going to get off the streets, which is, should be our goal. I understand that some of these people have mental problems. I understand that the police department is telling me people in law enforcement who I'm engaged with have mentioned that a lot of these people come to jail, they stabilize them, then they go back on the street, and it becomes a problem. But I need to see some numbers of how many people we have as homeless and how much it's going to reduce. For example, in the state of uh, Texas and San Antonio, they reduce homelessness by 50%, 57%. It's a statistic that I've heard. I can't confirm, but that's what I've heard. I had an idea for solar homeless shelters, which ties in with Tesla, shelters for the homeless. I talked to some people in the know that handled homelessness, homelessness, and they told me it would reduce it, reduce the problem 15%. What we want to see is people getting off the streets, and we need some solid numbers, and they have not been provided. Although it has been very clear that people with mental disorders need help. So I ask, I, I am against this bill. However, I ask that it needs more thinking, and we need some more firm numbers, and actually, we should be getting um, uh, maybe uh, some of the casinos to pay some of their making record profits. Maybe them helping out, not the whole, not put it on the burdens of the homeowners. Okay. Thank you for, for your time. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. All right. So BPS. Um, oh, go go ahead. I'm sorry. Is there another person? It's Bill okay, chair. Person? Yes. Can you hear me, chair? I can. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Marcos Lopez, for the record, Nevada Policy. Uh, SB 68, the two parts of it, the mental illness portion and the affordable health care, uh, affordable housing portion, uh, are both two important parts for me. Um, on the mental illness, unfortunately, I'm all too familiar with it. My grandfather suffers from PTSD, bipolar disorder, and has dementia. Um, and he has been a tremendous influence in my life, and watching him deteriorate has been a very sad experience. Um, but when we're looking at these objectives, which are very laudable goals, it's a disservice to them when we try to attach a tax increase to them. We're making this into a tax fight when it should be an issue and discussion about mental illness um, and how to pass this. 90% of the opposition here today could be eliminated if we drop this tax increase. Furthermore, on the second issue when it comes to affordable housing, um, we are too often uh, applying supply side remedies to our current housing crisis, we need to apply more, to, uh, too much demand side, my apologies, we need to start applying supply side. Uh, I will be entering a study into the record that Nevada Policy Research Institute published earlier this year uh, called The Construction of a Crisis. It's our part one of a three-part series that we will be doing of how we can address the uh, housing crisis that we're experiencing in our state. Our first level recommendation deals with zoning preemptions on local governments, as well as getting more land back from the federal government so we have more land to supply to be able to construct new housing. All of this will have a positive effect when it comes to our housing crisis. As we build more houses, regardless of what form of housing we are creating, uh, 
um, it will lead to lower rents and lower housing costs for the average individual. And this is something that we need to do. Our state is short tens of thousands of properties. Thank you so much for your time, Madam Chair and committee. Thank you for your testimony. So we will, so I will take the last person in Vegas and then I need to go to the phone and um, go ahead. If, you're, if the remarks have already been said, please say ditto. Hi, my name is Amy Meadle. I am a realtor and private business owner in Las Vegas. I have been a resident here of 45 years and I have worked for various government agencies and always been an advocate for women, children, seniors. Now I would add to that list first time home buyers. This is a very regressive tax and I have to say that it to me has felt very disingenuous when everyone keeps banding about an amount of $160. The transfer tax on a median home price in Clark County is going to be increased so that it's a full $2,338 per median home. That is not a small amount when I spend a huge amount of my time helping first time home buyers, helping people who have been renting and have seen their rents increase astronomical amounts. Someone just walked into my last open house that their rent had been increased $800. I've heard 800, 900, 1200. This is just over the past year. We don't want these communities to be held hostage and not be able to purchase their own homes. You are lowering the purchasing power of these people who are barely able to get into their own homes and get away from renting. This would be discouraging buying homes in Clark County. The, my other part of this commentary is I would really love to see existing programs that are related to housing be administered much better. I have seen too many people get housing vouchers and yet the programs that are supposed to be helping them, they do nothing to actually help these people get into a home to find it. We have to do more on the supply side. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So um, callers who are on the phone in opposition, I, I want to apologize to you. If you could turn in your testimony, send in your written comments. Um, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, we are going to shift to neutral if anyone is here in neutral on SB 68. If you could come to the table. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that's in neutral on SB 68? Is there anyone on the phone line in neutral on SB 68? BPS. Thank you, Chair. My apologies. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 68, please press star 9 on your phone or raise hand in your Zoom window to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Neal, for bringing this bill. While we support affordable housing, and I support many of the programs, uh, there are many tools that it can help. I am not supporting of the tax. And if you want to raise taxes, I think we could lower other taxes because our sales taxes here in Clark County was raised to help homelessness. This tax is regressive, just like many other taxes. Uh, also, it doesn't address many other homeless problems such as needed rehab, not to mention why housing is pretty expensive. High permit costs, codes, zoning, lack of construction, thanks to the fact that we have a few companies and builders that control much of the construction, Wall Street buying up properties that were once foreclosed, the Federal Reserve's low interest rates, eviction moratoriums, we should also look into expanding technologies such as boxable, 3D printing, not to mention look at the fact that the Bureau of Land Management has minutes. significant control of the land. That has an impact. We should also look at, at other metro areas why their median rents are significantly less than ours. Lastly, I just want to know, if you claim that housing is a right, 
how much are we entitled to? Just curious. Thank you so much, and please Ca reconsider caller, the bill. Caller, before you hang up, can you say your name? My apologies. It is Cyrus, C-Y-R-U-S. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. BPS, is there anyone else in neutral? Yes, because thank you, Chair. One moment. That was opposition, but just send that, send that to the opposition. Good afternoon, committee, Chairwoman Neal. Uh, my name is Jim DeGraffenreid, D-E-G-R-A-F-F-E-N-R-E-I-D. I am the National Committee Man for the Nevada Republican Party. We are here to testify in neutral on this bill because we support the policy portions of the bill uh, and are, are in full favor of that, but we do oppose the tax increase. Our platform says that residents of the state of Nevada are not under tax and state government is not underfunded. Our budget crisis is the result of years of overspending and mismanagement. As was stated before, we are actually running a surplus at this point due to significant federal transfer dollars due to the um, COVID emergency. And we believe that we should use those dollars rather than increasing um, taxes. If the tax part was removed, then we would be in support of the policy portions of the bill. Thank you. Thank you for that. BPS, is there anyone else in neutral? Thank you, Chair. Yes, we have one more caller at this moment. Okay. Go ahead, caller. State. Hello. Uh, my, my name is Lorena Cardenas. I'm in Senate District 8. Um, Republicans, remember why we voted for you? Stop taxing hardworking citizens. That's all I have to say about that. I oppose SB 68. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Uh, so, BPS, that was the final caller? Yes, Chair. Okay. Thank All you. Right. So we will go ahead and close neutral. Um, what I will do is go ahead and close SB 68. I don't think there's a need for a closing comment. Um, I don't have time for the closing comment. Um, <laughs> it's been compelling. So I'm going to close SB 68 and open up for SB 144. And if there are members that I know have a committee, um, we still will have a quorum so I can continue to hear SB 144. All right. She has to get her. Yeah. Welcome, Senator Lane, to Senate Revenue. I Thank have you. Listened to you. It's great to be here. <laughs> so we know a lot of people have to get to committees, so we're going to be quick if it's okay with you. We will do an introduction. We have a short PowerPoint, and we're going to skip the background on the sections of the bill um, because we assume the committee members, if they have questions, will ask us about those particular sections. Yes. Does that work for you? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, and while they're loading up the PowerPoint, I'm going to go ahead and start. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Neal. I'm Roberta Lang, representing Senate District 7, and I'm the sponsor of Senate Bill 144. Skills, mismatch, talent shortage, lack of labor are terms we hear repeatedly when we discuss workforce development and economic development. While the nature and scope of these terms may be open to debate, it's evidence that strengthening connections between employers and institutions of learning must be a priority. Career and technical education, known as CTE programs, provide a foundation of skills that prepare employees for long-lasting and high-paying careers. It is a win-win when Nevada businesses can build a relationship with CTE programs. The companies can make a huge difference in shaping the experience that today's students will have will inspire them toward future careers. Currently, an employer must pay an excise tax, which is more commonly known as a modified business tax or an MBT, on the wages paid to their employees each quarter. In addition, an insurer must pay tax to the Department of Taxation upon net direct premiums and direct considerations at the rate of 3.5%. This is the general tax on insurance premiums. Senate Bill 144 authorizes a taxpayer to receive a credit against their MBT or general tax on insurance premiums equal to an amount that is approved by the Department of Taxation. The amount may not exceed the donation made by a taxpayer to a CTE program tax credit organization selected by the department. This bill provides an application and approval process by the department as well as the specifics about the program. Today, Matt Morris, an associate with Holland and & Hart 
and Amanda Morgan from the Rogers Foundation are here to provide specific details about the bill. And at the end of the testimony, we'd be open to, for questions from the committee. Thank you so much, Amanda Morgan, for the record. Um, very much appreciate you all um, accommodating us and, and getting, <laughs> getting us up here. Um, so uh, SB 144 is about preparing Nevada students for the workforce. I'll talk a little bit about who we are um, and then go over some background on CTE generally. And then um, uh, Matt here will go into specifics. So um, Educate Nevada Now, powered by the Rogers Foundation, is a nonpartisan <coughs> education policy organization that really focuses on fair, equitable, and adequate um, resources for our Nevada students so they can succeed no matter uh, where they're from or what their background is. Um, what is career and technical education, or CTE? Um, CTE is education that combines academic and technical skills with knowledge and training needed to succeed in today's labor market. Um, it really prepares students for the careers of the future, introduces them to workplace competencies in the real world in applied context. Um, CTE can put students on a path to actually earn industry certificates, associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, or higher um, while they're in school. Uh, where are CTEs? They're in our middle schools, high schools, um, and colleges and some universities as well. Um, there's comprehensive CTE programs, which is just a CTE program that's contained within a, a general population school. There's also CTE designated schools and magnet schools. Um, and they can uh, be in traditional public schools and charter schools. There are 16 different program clusters, and I have a slide later on that kind of goes into all of them, but I just wanted to highlight some of the most popular here in Nevada. Um, Arts, AV, Tech, and Communications is the number one uh, program cluster for CTE. There's also Information Technology, Health Sciences, and Hospitality and Tourism. Um, the reason that we took on CTE and really wanted to focus on it this session is through Educate Nevada Now, we have given presentations all over the state, urban, rural, north, south, um, to business leaders, community members, and even though there's a lot of, you know, there's some agreement and some disagreement when it comes to public education, one thing that always came up in the positive is CTE. It was just a common ground among all these different groups. So we really felt like there was something there that we could do to increase access. Everyone understands its value, um, and it was really important for us to um, find ways for students to get into those programs. The benefits of investing in CTE for students, CTE concentrators, so these are students that are in secondary school and have taken two or more CTE courses in the same program, are more likely to graduate high school, attain post-secondary education, they earn more, they're more likely to maintain employment and learn employment skills and even life skills before graduating high school. For employers, the benefit is, you know, Pretty obvious, growing a skilled workforce, fostering a pipeline from high school to the workplace, um, and bringing in students through work-based learning opportunities, and closing the skills gap for pre-bachelor degree jobs. And that happens to be 40% of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics jobs. So these are middle school, middle skill careers where you don't necessarily need a four-year degree, but you do need to have um, some employment skills. Um, as mentioned, the graduation rate is higher for CTE concentrators, anywhere between 8 and 10 percent higher in the past few years. Um, they also found, you know, there's, there's a lot of recent research out right now um, looking at low-income households, special education students, and figuring out how CTE impacts them. Um, one recent study said that CTE can reduce the engagement gap between low-income and higher-income students meaning those students are more engaged in school, they're finding relevance in their coursework, they can actually see themselves using it, this in real life, um, and it improves their attendance. Um, CTE participation for students with disabilities, you know, it helps reduce the gap in graduation rate, academic performance, and college and career, and life skill ready readiness. <laughs> Going fast. Um, so who are Nevada CTE program students? Um, you obviously have this slide if you want to look over it. Um, but right now there's about 76,000 students. Those are students that have taken at least one course. Um, and if you look at the demographic data, in a large way it's proportional with, um, with the general population data. Um, but there certainly are areas of, of improvement, particularly with students with IEPs and English learners. Um, at the end of the day, um, the biggest challenge that states have with creating equity in CTE programs is resources and funding. 
Um, and we just wanted to put this in here. This is from the Government Accountability Office, the report to the congressional committees. Um, they talked a little bit about what, what are some challenges with CTE and delivering um, quality programs. And pretty much every, every, under every category, it really gets down to funding and resource capabilities, um, finding the staff, um, you know, just professional development, uh, transportation, and, and just removing those barriers for students. And uh, lastly for me, um, this is the 16 program clusters and uh, what type of uh, courses our students are taking here in Nevada. Again, you can see the top four, AV, hospitality, um, information technology. I, I also wanted to highlight education and training. That's one of the governor's priorities this session is to utilize CTE to address the teacher pipeline issue. So that's another one that we're, um, we're excited about. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt Morris to talk a little bit more about uh, specifics. I could stop here if there's any questions generally on CTE. No, go ahead and continue your presentation. We'll ask questions at the end. Thank you, Chair Neal and members of the committee. Matt Morris with Holland and Hart for the record. Um, uh, just want to present sort of broadly the idea behind Senate Bill 144. Uh, currently in Nevada, businesses can contribute uh, to directly uh, donate to private schools via a tax credit scholarship and there, there isn't a similar mechanism for um, public education and so SB 144 is based on models from other states and also successful tax incentive programs that have worked in Nevada uh, that would allow a private company a private entity to donate directly to a CTE program and in return for that donation uh, receive a tax credit uh, against the modified business tax or the payroll tax or the insurance premium tax. So one of the models that we looked at uh, is in effect in Arizona. It's been in effect since 2003. Uh, it is the um, public school tax credit. It's a non-refundable tax credit for contributions directly to uh, public school programs. It can be a $10 donation, $100, $1,000 donation. Um, and it supports educational purposes, including extracurricular activities, character education, CTE assessments. And uh, as of the most recent data that we reviewed, it generates approximately 50 to $55 million annually. It's a credit against the Arizona uh, personal income tax. There's a similar program in Georgia. It's capped at uh, $5 million per year. Uh, it's uh, known as the Qualified Education Donation Tax Credit. I think the name uh, recently changed in the, in the last month or so. But it essentially creates an innovation uh, fund, uh, and donations to the fund are then redistributed as grants to public schools, public school, public education programs, and that generates $5 million uh, per year in the state of Georgia. Uh, the Government Accountability Office report that Amanda just cited also um, surveyed other states that have been successful with these types of programs. Um, one successful case study uh, was in the state of Delaware, where uh, a, a for-profit corporation donated $400,000 to a CTE program uh, in healthcare and construction trades, and it served over 200 uh, students in those areas, in those career pathways. And there are similar CTE scholarship programs in the state of Washington, Again, allowing a private company to make a donation uh, to a CTE program and receive some uh, form of a tax credit. So what SB 144 does is it draws on those models. It draws on similar tax incentive programs that have been in place in Nevada since at least 2013 um, that offer tax credits against the payroll tax or the insurance premium tax uh, to support development in certain areas, economic development, affordable housing, and I shudder to even mention that topic, but I, it, there is a bill that allows um, a credit against modified business tax and insurance premium tax for certain affordable housing programs um, that was passed in 2019. So SB 144 draws on those uh, successful models. It would allow a business to apply through a 501c3 um, CTE tax credit organization that the Nevada Department of Taxation would select and a business can apply through that entity to the department for a tax credit, articulate the intention to make a donation to a CTE program that the uh, tax, tax credit organization would compile a list for. Uh, the Department of Taxation would approve or deny that application, 
and then the CTE tax credit organization would make recommendations to the State Board of Education that would ultimately decide which eligible approved CTE programs would receive a, a grant award based on um, the donations uh, that were made to that 501c3 organization. Um, the bill generally establishes a CTE tax credit program administered by this uh, 501c3 organization. Um, the organization has to be incorporated in Nevada and have uh, experience administering these types of education grants. Um, this is similar to the Georgia model, similar to other uh, models that are in place in Nevada. Requires the CTE program to be approved and compliant in order to be eligible for a CTE grant award. So an existing CTE program, let's say in welding, would apply to the uh, tax credit organization and express interest in applying for grant funds. Um, the CTE tax credit organization would take that application, make a recommendation to the state board. The state board would approve or deny the application and the funds if approved would go directly to that CTE program. Uh, funds that, the funds could be used for the CTE uh, operational expenses that include supplies, technology, curriculum, or professional development. Um, the funds could be used to finance or lease CTE specific facilities. And uh, the funds could be used for other NDE approved program expenses. So every year the Department of Education puts out an RFA um, announcing that there will be grant awards using Perkins dollars. It's federal Perkins um, fund uh, dollars. And so the department has already articulated a, a list of approved uses for CTE uh, dollars. And the idea would be that those types of expenses that the department has already approved um, would be eligible for this grant donation program as well. So the Nevada Department of Taxation may approve up to $10 million in tax credits per fiscal year. The credit is applied against the modified business tax or payroll tax or the insurance premium tax. Um, one of the key features, I think, of this bill is that the taxpayer can identify a preferred CTE program to receive the, donate, the donated funds. So the taxpayer can say, I, I really need students to, to complete this particular CTE program, whether it's in healthcare or welding or uh, IT. Uh, whatever it is, there's about 80 different career pathway programs under CTE in Nevada. And then the tax credit organization can take that recommendation or that preference, make a recommendation to the state board, uh, which ultimately has the authority um, on whether to donate the funds to that particular program. State Board of Education determines which CTE programs are awarded um, and the amount of the grant award. Um, there is a provision in the bill, uh, section one, subsection 12, that um, prohibits any of these donations from supplanting or replacing federal state matching funds um, that are required under the Perkins Act, Perkins program. So that's the high level overview and I will go ahead and pause and answer any questions. Thank you. There's any questions? Okay, so uh, Senator Ganser. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So as far as like the course, so two courses is the standard, is that the standard that's been used in Arizona or other states? Because that seems like a low threshold. So you're talking about the sequential two courses? Yeah. Yep. And that's a minimum. It's a, it's a floor and it's required for, um, under current regulation, in order to obtain a, uh, an endorsement, a CTE endorsement on a high school diploma, you have to have two sequential courses, one an introductory course and one a, to show that you've mastered um, the course, the content. Thank you, so you're tying that to current statute for CTE. And so just a thought about tying it to that statute versus putting it in here in case that ever moves. Just a thought, and I, I didn't know that was a standard. Um, and then the uh, directing the funds, I understand that the, the Board of Education is actually going to be the ultimate decision maker, but my question would be about making sure that it doesn't, uh, like all the funds just, and, and because you're also designating a preference, that one organization or one eligible entity or three eligible entities don't just get all the money because uh, you know there's there may not be a diversification of how the money is spread um, the way that it's written uh, rec recognizing that there's actually discretion at the board of ed so just how would how, how do you would you like to re respond to that 
No, it's, it's a great question, thank you. And so the way that this is structured, um, the State Board of Education does have the sole discretion to determine how much and which program. Um, and the purpose behind that is so that the State Board of Education can sort of see the whole landscape. Uh, where where are CTE program dollars most needed, right? And part of that is to make sure that, as you said, that all of the funds don't go to one zip code or one type of CTE program, but also that they go to where the um, CTE resources are most needed. And a lot of times that is in emerging technology and the type of, um, you know, sort of cutting edge equipment that you need for uh, industry sectors, innovative industry sectors. And so the reason why the State Board has that discretion um, is to make sure that those dollars go where they're needed most. Thank you. I just have one last follow-up. And, and, and I really support CTE. I think it's extremely effective, so I'm glad the bill's here today. Um, so what happens if, if the preferred organization, if the Department of Education doesn't agree with the preferred organization designated by um, someone who's <coughs> contributing? Uh, the State Board would be able to, to deny that application. Um, or they can, um, the CTE intermediate organization makes recommendations, and so they'd be able to send that back. The Department of Taxation approves the credit amount, so it's not the credit amount that would be subject to the State Board, it would just be where those dollars are going. Oh, I see. Okay, so, so the Department of Taxation establishes the credit amount, and then the entity, and, and then the uh, eligible organizations are a function of the Department of Education. And so if you're eligible, I guess you have to make sure that the preferred organization always has to be one of the eligible organizations, and I'm, I'm not quite sure if the language does that, ties the two together? Yes. Um, so Matt Morse, for the record. So the CTE tax credit organization reviews eligible CTE programs and makes sure that those programs are compliant with uh, the bill, that they meet the, the, the minimum standards to be eligible, that they're approved, they're existing, and then they create a list a list of eligible CTE programs. And then a taxpayer would be able to identify from that list a, a preferred um, program. And then um, assuming that the state board approves the program and the award, then it would th those, uh, those funds would go to that program. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Any additional questions? So I just have a, well, a couple of questions. So on... Um, I guess it's page four. I don't know if that's all section one. Um, so page four, it's I believe it's sub nine when we're talking about um, what the money may be used for. We're talking about the operational expenses, um, technology, curriculum, professional development, and then finance or leasing school facilities that directly support the program of career tech. Um, I guess the questions that I had is, um, number one, uh, financing a school facility, uh, what what that looks like in terms of this, I guess, this tax credit and how that would play into, I guess, an entity that would choose to do that. Um, because typically, number one, we have capital um, finance or ca or bonding that's associated with schools. So why why was this an anticipated idea? And then tell me how that would work with an outsider coming in. Thank you, Chair Neal, for the question. Matt Morris, for the record. So part of this is included because, again, the Department of Education uh, publishes an RFA every year that um, announces uh, Perkins Federal CTE grant funding. And as part of that RFA, the Department of Education tells programs what they can use that federal federal money for, and among that um, list is uh, facilities, equipment, instructional materials, and classroom supplies. And that includes, for example, you know, retrofitting a welding shop. I keep using welding shop, but that's, I mean, if you, if you have an, uh, let's say, an outdated facility that's used, whatever the context, you need to retrofit that, or if you need to update it, build a new one. Um, that's, those are the types of uh, uses that are currently approved by the department, and we would want to make sure that there's parity with uh, with this program as well. So, so tell me how that would work. So, this is a moment of educating me, right? So, you have a tax credit incentive to participate, and so let's say a person says, "Okay, I would like to build them 
a new welding facility. What is the structure of that credit when the person, when there's bonding involved? And then what's the overlap with the local school district? Because when I was looking up Perkins dollars, right, there is some local money, there's state money already in play. So build me the financial cake. That's what I need you to build me right now. So thank you for the question. It would depend, and it's I, I couldn't speculate on all the different ways that you could do this. Um, I think, number one, it would have to be a significant um, donation amount for, for something like that. And it would trigger, as you rightly point out, it would trigger potentially um, bonding rules and, and other rules around capital construction and things like that. But um, the Department of Taxation would have the first shot at reviewing the application and the intent from the taxpayer, looking at how much they're going to donate, what it's going to be going toward. Um, and so they would have the first shot at saying, okay, does this really make sense? Assuming that they do, they approve that credit amount, and then the taxpayer has to make the donation within 30 days. Uh, and then, again, the State Board of Education gets to sort of give the final sign-off. So I, I think what I would say is there are multiple levels of review to make sure that the donation is going to go where it's intended to go, that it makes sense on a lot of different levels, and I think including the financing of a project. And those can be very complicated, as I think your, you know, your question implies. Uh, I couldn't get into what they would all, you know, what all those different steps would be. Um, but I, I would say that the reason why this is a $10 million tax credit program is in part because if somebody has the ambition to do something like that, to donate, to construct a new facility, then this bill um, intends to allow those types of uh, donations and support. Thank you for that, Senator Buck. Thank you so much, Chair Neal. I was just wondering if you had a donor who wanted to um, give money to buy a building, um, could they do a CTE charter school then? Um, thank you for the question, Matt Morris, the record. So charters are included in this bill, and I, I, um, I think your question is, well, they're just, they're equally eligible. So if someone wanted to, um, you know, build a new facility or donate to a new facility for a charter school, and assuming that it was approved, again, through the different layers that I just described, initially at the Department of Taxation level and then all the way up through the State Board, then a project like that would be eligible. So if the donor wants to give to a particular school, um, then that's okay? It's uh, they can identify a preference. And again, the, the um, tax credit organization would make recommendations and they would be required to account for that preference. And then that preference and recommendation goes to the State Board of Education, which would in, be intended to sort of look at that preference and say, you know, and give weight to it, uh, because the intent here is a closer alignment between workforce and particular programs. Mm -hmm. So if a donor says that program makes sense for my workers, for my employees, for what I'm trying to do in Nevada, um, then there's supposed to be some weight to that in this process. Um, it wouldn't be the donor's final decision. It would be the state board through that review process. And I was just wondering also, would it be calculated at some point into the per pupil? Because I know that we're always saying that we're so underfunded, and then if a big allocation goes in, um, would that somehow be public so that we knew that, okay, this, these monies are coming into public education, so. So, so Amanda is the uh, pupil-centered pro, and I'm gonna hand okay. that off to her. Amanda Morgan for the record. So currently, for example, Perkins dollars are not accounted in our typical per pupil funding when our, you know, the state education fund enacting uh, legislation. Um, this would be outside the pupil-centered funding plan. Um, I know that there's different per pupil figures that are developed, some of them include capital funding, some of them include uh, federal dollars and any state spending. Typically when we get compared to other states, they're looking at expenditure data. Um, so if you're looking at expenditure data, it often includes these types of programs. But for the purpose of identifying it in the pupil-centered funding plan, um, you know, alloc legislation, um, it would not be considered part of that. 
Thank you for that. So I don't think there's any additional questions. We'll open up for support on SB 144. Fill in all three chairs. So because we're running out of time, we're going to reduce the two minutes to one minute. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Chair Neal and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Nick Schneider. I'm a policy analyst for the Vegas Chamber. The Vegas Chamber is in support of SB 144. SB 144 is a product of the Southern Nevada Forum Economic Development Committee, uh, the purpose of which is to determine nonpartisan issues that impact the Southern Nevada region. As Nevada strives to diversify our workforce and attract new industries, uh, Career Technical Education, or CTE, has proven to be a successful tool in Clark County as it provides students with alternative education options that are essential components of preparing our students to participate in an increasingly competitive global economy. This bill helps put student achievement first by supporting a model that works. Graduating students who are prepared for careers in innovative sectors are a critical component of our ever-growing uh, economy. The Chamber believes using a tax credit model that incentivizes private sector dollars to be directly invested in public education CTE programs will promote a closer alignment between private sector employers and our public education system. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Craig Madol, the CEO of the Nevada Chapter AGC. Uh, we strongly support this bill. We think this is a great opportunity to allow businesses to make the investment in their future workforce. We think that this tax credit uh, model will work well, and we strongly encourage your support. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Ashley Cruz with Career Nevada for the record, here on behalf of our client, the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. We are in support of SB 144. Workforce and talent challenges are among the top three priorities for industries seeking to expand and help diversify Nevada. As written, LVGEA supports SB 144 and would like to see conversations supporting career and technical education continue. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Andrew McCam, the Executive Director of the Nevada Franchise Auto Dealers Association. Thank you uh, very much to the bill sponsor. Uh, nationwide, just to keep pace with uh, retirements and new entrants in, in or ex excuse me, our expanding industry, um, we need to have 76,000 techs every single year. When you look specifically into Nevada, these are high paying jobs and it's arguably our hardest uh, space to recruit for. The average tech in Nevada makes over $70,000 a year. Um, experienced techs uh, that have been doing it for a long time make over $100,000 a year. This is a uh, sector that our members invest heavily in, and we cannot thank the bill sponsor enough on this and encourage support. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Next. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair, Center Revenue and Economic Development Committee. My name is Gil Lopez, representing the Charter School Association of Nevada. Uh, today I'm here in, to express our support for SB 144. We also want to thank uh, Chair Lang for bringing this bill forward. Uh, we're particularly grateful to, to have uh, public charter schools included in this legislation. This will allow all these different institutions to continue to innovate in the field of CTE. Uh, once again, we urge the committee to support SB 144 and help ensure that, uh, that all Nevada students can access the best education and career training. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for that. Next. Thank you, Chairwoman Neal and members of the committee. My name is Wiz Rizar, Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity Nevada. Much like the members here share, we did have some concerns with the bill, but we do believe that this uh, is a great step in the right direction in ensuring that uh, every student has access to uh, educational opportunities that foster unique potential. Uh, their unique potential, whether it be public or private, charter or homeschool or anything else. Uh, we truly advocate policies that increase educational freedom um, and I believe that this bill, SB 144, helps us accomplish that. And I do want to say thank you to the bill sponsors and you, Chairwoman, for giving this bill the opportunity to be heard. And we greatly appreciate and ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, my name's Kevin Weiske, W-E-I-S-K-E, -E, Moody Weiske Contractors in Reno. Also a member of the Associated General Contractors of Northern Nevada. Madam Chair, ditto. Thank you very much for your patience in getting us here. 
thank you for that. Next. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Glenn Levitt, Director of Government Affairs for the Nevada Contractors Association. We represent over 450 contractors, subcontractors, and affiliated industry um, professionals, primarily in Southern Nevada. And uh, he stole my thunder. Ditto. Thank you. I appreciate that. Next. Hello, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, Eddie Diaz, Strategic Director with the Libre Initiative. We're a grassroots organization. Um, we are solutions-based, freedom-minded solutions that benefit all. And we strongly support um, education opportunities for all Nevada families, especially Hispanic Lat um, Latino families. So we're, I'm not going to take much of your time. I'm going to do everything my partner Wiz from Americans for Pro Prosperity said. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Przinski here representing Nevada Association of School Superintendents, which is a body composed of all 17 superintendents. CTE is very important to us, to our schools. Our graduation rate among uh, our kids who are in CT is very good, and, and uh, we support this bill and want to thank the senator for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Philip Manley, P-H-I-L-I-P-M-A-N-N-E-L-L-Y. I'm a board member at Academy of Career Education, ACE um, High School in Reno, Nevada, CTE High School. Has programs such as diesel mechanics, CAD drawing, and building trades. Highly successful um, charter school, and um, I'm here strongly in support of this bill. Um, ditto and, and what the folks before me have said, but also um, capital funding and facility fund, funding for facilities for um, our school in particular is very difficult, and this bill would go a long way to continue um, the support of our school and to ensure the uh, livelihood of our school moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Mary, M-A-R-I, Nakashima, N-A-K-A-S-H-I-M-A, -A Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N, -E on behalf of the Washoe School Principals and Administrators Association. We have many successful CTE programs, and we would appreciate the dedicated funding source. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right, um, is there anyone on BPS and support? For SB Thank you, Chair, to testify in support, sir. Sorry. To testify in support of Senate Bill 144, please press star nine on your phone or raise hand in your Zoom window to take your place in the queue. Caller, please press star six to unmute. You are unmuted. Please begin. Good afternoon, Chair Neal and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jennifer Loescher, L-O-E-S-C-H-E-R. I'm currently an educator with Southern Nevada Regional Professional Development Program and a senior policy fellow with Teach Plus Nevada. Today, I offer the perspective of an educator who has worked within CCSD for 23 years. And as a Teach Plus Senior Policy Fellow, I support SB 144. For my time today, I'd like to humanize the incredible benefit of the CTE programs. One of my colleagues of students, we'll call her Sarah, was able to, upon graduation from a CTE school, be hired as a certified nursing assistant because of her experience with the CTE programming. She was hired most specifically because of the clinical experience she was able to have as part of the CTE program. And as a result of the programming, will complete her bachelor's degree in two and a half years rather than the typical four to five years that it takes to graduate with an undergraduate degree. As we continue to make decisions that will improve our education system, we have the opportunity to increase the number of students who are invited to access this level of equitable and excellent education. SB 144, as mentioned before, is a step in the right direction to find additional sustainable funding sources for our CTE programming and increases the partnerships that we can cultivate between our community and our schools. And for those reasons, I support SB 144. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that. Is there anyone else on the line? Yes, Chair, let me cue them up for you. One moment, please.
Caller, you're unmuted. Please begin. Good afternoon, uh, Chair um, Nielsen and the rest of the committee. This is Dora Martinez, representative of the Disability Peer Action Coalition, and happy Disability Development and Disability Awareness Month. And we are wholeheartedly in support of this bill. And thank you so much. Drive safe and take care. Thank you for that. BPS, is there anyone else in support on the line? Thank you, Chair. Yes, one moment, one moment. Caller, you're unmuted. Please begin. Hello, Marcos Lopez for the record, M-A-R-C-O-S, L-O-P-E-Z, Nevada Policy. We're in support of SB 144. This is a great move to make sure we have career and technical education available and able to get the funds needed. We have a situation in our labor force right now where, unfortunately, we have an aging population in terms of skilled trade and skilled labor. So anything we can do to drive that uh, number down and get more people into the workforce will be a positive move for our economy. As well as one of the things that I do want to point out, we make sure we're doing in conjunction with this, is making sure that we're addressing occupational licensing regime. We don't want to have a situation where we have kids learning their skills and the certain trades, but are unable to make it into the workforce to get that license because they don't have the thousands of dollars to be able to apply for it. Thank you. Thank you for that. BPS, anyone else? Oh. Uh let me check for you, Chair. Once again, to testify in support on Senate Bill 144, please press star nine on your phone or raise hand in your window to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chair Neal and committee members. My name is Karen Shea. I'm a public education advocate and a parent I'm grateful to ENN for bringing this forward and thrilled to see the bipartisan legislative support for SB 144. And I wish to add my parent and constituent support as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. BPS. Chair, at this time, there are no additional callers wishing to testify in support. Okay, thank you for that. So we will go to opposition on SB 144 if there are more than one person. Okay, go ahead. There's always one, I apologize. Um, Alexander Marks with the Nevada State Education Association. I'll make my comments brief. We've submitted the full comments into the record. Um, while NSA is a proponent of career and technical education, we just oppose the tax, mechani tax mechanism proposed in SB 144 on principle. Instead, NSEA would recommend up to a $10 million appropriation for CTE from project projected general fund revenues, including the modified business tax. Um, while CTE is worthy of additional funding, we just believe the mechanism is the wrong way to approach this, um, and we believe the legislature should support this uh, through prioritizing programs within the regular budget. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone on uh, the phone, BPS in opposition? Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 144, please press star 9 on your phone or raise hand in your Zoom window to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Okay. Is there anyone in Carson in neutral on SB 144? Okay, seeing none. Is there anyone on the phone in neutral, BPS? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 144, please press star 9 on your phone or raise hand in your Zoom window to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Chair, I mean, any, you're, okay. So I will go ahead and close the hearing on SB 144, and I will open up for public comment. Is there anyone in the room for public comment? BPS, is there anyone on the phone for public comment? Thank you, Chair. To provide public comment, please press star nine on your phone or raise hand. Raise hand in your Zoom window to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no public comment callers at this time. Okay, so we will go ahead and adjourn Senate Committee on Revenue and Economic Development.